I'm thrilled that so many people have um, jumped into this session. Um, and I think it tells us a lot about our need for it. Um, first of all, who am I? Alison Wright Reed. I'm chair of IOSH's Broadcasting Communications Group. Um, I've been an IOSH member for an awfully long time. Um, over the years, I've had a lot of support from IOSH, from, from my colleagues uh, and fellow members in IOSH and in other professional bodies, particularly BOHS. Um, I got my chartered fellow a couple of years ago, and I'd encourage everybody to move up through the, uh, the gradings. Um, I've been studying stress for a long time, since the 70s. Um, it's a fascinating, hugely powerful mechanism, a phenomenal risk multiplier with effects not only on our health, but our accidents, effects on, our, on organizational culture, affected by organizational culture, endlessly intriguing, endlessly fascinating, lots and lots of lessons to learn, and a few too many of them learn the hard way. Even, I've failed, even I have failed to recognize when I'm becoming stressed. Um, we find the safety practitioners, I'm surprised how many of my safety colleagues have become unwell um, and have had it pointed out by their doctor um, when they're no longer able to go to work. We, we need to be looking after ourselves more. Um, we need to be checking in on ourselves more. So I think well, this, uh, for me, the most powerful thing of this session is understanding how you yourself react to stress, what's causing stress in your life, and how to make yourself more resilient by mastering uh, the demands upon you. Um, and we're often the only people around. We're often faced with very reactive work finding centers of control and finding ways of looking after yourself. Um, oh, just to back up a moment, I know Dim, uh, Dimple said the, uh, the, we'll be uh, taking questions all the way through. Um, and if we don't get through all the questions at the end of the session, because there are quite a lot of you, um, we'll uh, collate the questions afterwards. If you've got something that you think of that you don't want to put in the questions or comes to mind afterwards, then do please um, be, feel free to welcome me. The email address will be up at the end. Um, we'll be, I'll do my best to put some FAQs together um, and make available, um, if you email me, some of the um, templates and things uh, from, the, uh, from the presentation. Um, so back to um, why, do, why do we get stressed? Um, and it's not just about like being the um, being the cobbler's children and um, being the last, you know, failing to look after ourselves because we're so busy looking after everybody else. Um, one of the things that we specialize in health and safety is thinking about horrible things, all the things that can go wrong. Um, we're, the, we're the professional black hats, um, but it's not natural and it's not healthy to think about dark things all the time. So we have to, apart from anything else, insulate ourselves against the effects of having to think about dark things all the time. Um, we are the people who get called in to deal with the accidents, to investigate the accidents, to see the trauma, to see the blood, to be listening to the 999 recordings of the 999 calls, to be taking the witness statements, um, to, to some, be lied to, um, to know that you're being lied to, to know that somebody's trying to falsify an accident investigation, to, to feel thoroughly compromised when you're doing your best to help. Um, we're often the only health and safety person in an organization or one of a very, very tiny number. So we feel more isolated. We, we, have, we have to put a lot of effort in to connect with our wider health and safety tribe. We can feel that um, we're unwelcome, that the health, the health and safety um, is still too much of a stick, to, too popular a stick to beat us with that we're um, caricat uh, caricatured as the, the people who like to say no, um, that people will listen to our advice perhaps, but not do anything about it, but then turn on us when things go wrong because you're the health and safety person, it's your fault. All of that, all of this dancing to other people's demands um, and of being the only person around who can do it, can leave us feeling completely swamped um, and out of control and stressed. Um, and we 
it's a call, stress is a call to action. But um, we need to make very sure that we defend ourselves. Um, if this is your to-do list, um, then there are things that we can help you with. Um, this is not a to-do list. This is a list of projects. It's a list of headlines. There are no actual tasks in this. There are deadlines in this. It's a list of things to worry about. The purpose of a to-do list is to free up your brain so that you can think about the details of actions rather than just think of the projects that are bearing down on you. So when these all deaths get too much, you're dancing to somebody else's drum. Stress starts to kick in. It's powerful. It's, it's designed to save the lives of hunter gatherers. Um, and it will manage you if you do not choose to manage it. Your brain will go to automatic. So you'll become stupid, forgetful. You'll start functioning at lower levels. You'll become hypersensitive. Your body will brace for attack. So you'll become tense. Um, you will suffer lots of, uh, you'll hyperventilate, you'll suffer muscular damage. It will hold all discretionary activity. So your body ceases to repair itself. Um, it will defend you against bacteria because that's what's on the teeth and claws of the things that attack you. It will make you more prone to viruses, including viruses that are just living inside your system. Um, it will keep you awake because it would be really stupid to go to sleep when you're about to be killed. That will provoke inflammation. Inflammation will make you feel horrible. It will make you want instant energy. So forget healthy diets. You'll start snuffling sugar left, right, and center. And that makes the inflammation worse, makes you feel worse. It's, it's a call to work to action, but it does enormous damage in the short term. Um, and that damage ratchets. The bad thing is that if you let stress get out of control, it will make things worse. All the other effects will become worse. The good thing is that if you make some action, you will get multiple benefits out of it. That if you are physically less tense, there will be less muscle damage. There will be less damage to repair. There will be more capacity to repair damage. There will be less pain. You will be able to sleep. If you sleep well, your brain is less inflamed the next day. Your body is less inflamed the next day. You are calmer, work is easier. We will not spend a huge amount of time worrying about the effects of stress. Let's see some of the things that we can do about it. The I think one of the most important things is to know your own, how stress affects you. What are your telltales? Discover your early warning signs and start looking out for them. They will be physical, behavioral, mental, and emotional. The physical effects, muscle tension, jaw tension, grinding teeth, cracking headaches, uh, not, uh, not able to eat, eating everything in sight. Well, that's a behavioral issue. Um, on behavior, your behavior degrades, your habits come to the front because stress, stress can't allow your energy consuming, slow acting modern brain to be in command. It puts your primitive brain in command. Um, and all your unhelpful habits and unhelpful coping skills come through to the fore. So what are your little telltale habits and when do those come up? Um, how does stress affect your, uh, affect your uh, mental capacity? Um, what, are your, what are the effects that it has on you? We can, we're often told that uh, we only use about half our brain at a time, which is one of those wonderful, absolutely incorrect myths our brain is operating at maximum capacity a lot of the time. There's a tremendous organ crammed into a very small space consuming a huge amount of energy. It operates at close to max. So when it's dealing with an emergency, it has to jettison a lot of other activities. Those would include memory, or they include attention. When you're stressed, you don't remember things, you don't learn things, you rely on habits. 
um, and you become it becomes much harder for you to control your emotions you become um, more fragile um, more volatile um, and all that time you're still trying to make sense of the emergency so you're becoming ever more confused and you've got thoughts rattling around everywhere uh, you become less productive uh, you start thinking in the short term, you become reckless, you become accident prone, you become the kinds of things you don't want a health and safety person to be. You don't want a reckless, confused health and safety advisor. But that will happen when your modern brain has been parked so that the rest of your brain can handle the emergency. What are your telltales? Do you talk to yourself as if you were an enemy? Do you sit stewing in the dark, unable to decide what to do? Do you cling rigidly to past practices? Or do you sit in the corner and worry? Do you have nightmares? Or do you completely check out of reality? What are your telltales? When you become emotional, what way do you tend to go? Most of us will go in a particular direction, be feeling insecure or perhaps feeling or fighting it with aggression, becoming gloomy or cynical, especially when we're, again, in, in jobs where people lie to us all the time or promise to do things and don't do it. And we just feel endlessly let down and feel even more that we have to do everything ourselves because you can trust nobody. Do you shut yourself off from all the connections that could help you, including your safety colleagues? Uh, we'd love to think, sudden weight loss, we would love to think that stress will make us lose weight. Uh, most of the time, alas, it does not. Most of the time, stress makes us eat for our lives and pile all this emergency fat around our middles. Do you suddenly get squeaky? Does your vision blur? Does your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth? Do you get pins and needles because you're hyperventilating? Do you get palpitations because you're hyperventilating? Do you get chest pains because you're hyperventilating? Are you tired all the time? Because even when you do sleep, the quality of your sleep is awful. Or do you get nauseous and sweaty? Do your allergies get worse? Again, what are your telltales? Think about when you've been stressed in the past, what it's been like, and talk to people that you trust. What do they see? They will see things before you see them. They will see things sometimes months before you see them. <laughs> You'll need, uh, you need a high tolerance for candor to ask people about how you behave. Um, but you will have telltale behaviors. Um, and it might be an extra bottle of wine in the evening to wind down. Uh, you may self-sabotage, uh, which just makes everything even more difficult. If your day wasn't hard enough to begin with, by the time you've made yourself late and let people down, it's going to be even worse. You'll have seen this in other people. It's hard as a safety advisor to be advising people um, how to manage stress when people who are stressed can be so annoying, so difficult, so challenging and so unpleasant to work with. We need to try to make sure that we are not those challenging, unpleasant people. So what can you do? Obviously, what you should do is get rid of the things that are causing stress or control the things that are causing stress. Um, and we're all familiar with the, the, this, the management standards for stress and the organizational stressors. But you need to be able to think in order to be able to do that. And when you're stressed, you can't think. So get into the habit. I suggest, I strongly urge you, urge you to get into the habit of managing your body so that it can attack stress at a very primitive level. Stress is an extremely primitive response. You can turn it off at an extremely primitive level. Get back control of your brain and then sit down and think your way through your problems. So how do you do that? The most important thing is to control your breathing. 
um, stress makes you breathe shallow and fast. It, you're out, you, you, become, you start to hyperventilate, you feel rushed and hurried. You need to control it. There are different techniques that you can use, your pranic breathing, yoga, just exercises that make you breathe slowly, box breathing. Um, I find it is a easy, nice, easy one to teach um, and a nice, easy one to do. You can do it absolutely anywhere when you're standing waiting for coffee, when you're waiting to go into a meeting, when you're in a meeting. Um, if you'd like to try it now, it takes about a minute. The idea is to slow you down and to make you count so that your brain has something to do and it's the, uh, the counting takes over from the chatter that is occupying your mind. It gives you a little bit of space, a little bit of clarity. To do it, you breathe in for a count of three, in, two, three, you hold for three, hold, two, three, out for three, out, two, three, hold, two, three, in, two, three, hold, two, three, out, two, three, hold, two, three, in two three and hold two three out hold two three and in two three hold two three and breathe out and after about a minute it tells your body's sensory systems that you're okay and it turns the stress response off you can get more out of this if you're somewhere that it doesn't matter too much by going into a power posture because a lot of the time those of us who spend all day in cars and sitting over computers we go into a very hunched posture and that hunched posture has all your joints and muscles constantly telling the brain i am cowering from attack i am doing my best to keep my head down and protect my neck and protect my stomach i think i'm going to be attacked and that primes your brain to be stressed you get yourself into a power posture, it does two things. First thing is the joints and muscles tell the brain, I'm confident, I'm willing to take up space. How do you do it? You stand up, get your feet wide apart, wider than hip, di than, than sh than hip distance, wider than shoulder distance, plant your feet, straighten up all the way through the hips, get your shoulders out, it really is full on Superman, hands on hips, head up, but head back. And if you're really feeling like it, you grin the cheesiest grin that you can, because then your face tells your brain that you're feeling safe and happy and you are able to think. Um, so that's those three. They're, they're my stress first aid and it works. It shouldn't work. It's so foolish, but it does. And how much time does that take in a very busy day? 90 seconds, you can fit it in all over the place. Get into the habit of regular breathing and regular power postures, regular straightening up. It lets your brain know it's okay. What are these other images for? I hate to tell you, but cold showers really do work. Um, they, they kind of recalibrate your stress system. They give it an idea of, you know, the kind of, that this horrible blast of cold water really is something to worry about. It makes other things seem less of an issue. Um, the flowers and hearts, gratitude. Getting into the habit of gratitude, looking for things that are good. It primes your attention. It draws you away from everybody hates me, going down the garden to eat worms. There's good stuff around. There are some people who follow your advice. There are some people who say thank you. It makes you feel better about yourself. It makes you see the world in a better light. It makes you feel less hopeless. And one of the things that will save you sometimes is simply love and expressing gratitude for the people who are in your life will help you be closer to them and more protected by them. So for me, the pillars of resilience, not just after you've dealt with your first aid, um, you've, you'll be thinking about your stressors and you want to get ahead with protecting your life. The ultimate is sleep. Sleep is your magic skill. Master sleep. 
learn about sleep, practice really good sleep habits. The, the awful thing is it's easy stuff, uh, but we don't do it. Um, so what makes for good sleep? One is having a bedtime. Second thing, your bedroom is only for two things. Third thing, your bedroom is dark. Invest in some, in some uh, decent blinds. What they call Blackout blinds. <laughs> you see, when you're stressed, you see the simple things you can't remember. Invest in blackout blinds. If you haven't got blackout blinds yet, get a good eye mask. When you travel, take a good eye mask with you. Um, invest in a decent mattress, invest in decent pillows and replace them. Set yourself a bedtime based on when you need to get up. Try to keep bedtime and rising time approximately, reasonably constant. Set yourself a, an alcohol, caffeine and email curfew. A good time before you go to bed. If you have alcohol in your system when you, go to, when you are going to bed, yes, it makes you feel sleepier. Yes, it makes you want to go to sleep, but it disrupts your sleep really, really badly. It's just not worth it. Go dry. Your bank balance will enjoy it and your waistline will enjoy it as well. Clear your head before you start getting ready for bed. If the, if the point where your head hits the pillow is the first opportunity you've had all day to hear yourself think, then your thoughts will run wild. Settle your thoughts beforehand. Get it all out earlier in the day. Um, and just think good things before you hit the head hits the pillow. Um, think about the things that have gone well that day. Think about the people that you love. Think about what's going to be good about tomorrow. So that's that one. What are these other images? To the left, I think the next biggie, movement. Physical movement, mental movement. Mental movement, personal growth, CPD. Physical movement, use your body. If you sit still, your brain will start to hibernate you and your muscles and everything will just go to mush. Um, and it, your, it has a, a depressing effect. So get up and move about. Every 25 minutes, get on your feet and move around. Your brain and your thinking will thank you for it. You'll, get, you'll think, no, no, I have to just plow on. That's the, um, that's the flat out fallacy. It doesn't work. You get much more creativity, standing up, getting away, going for a walk, your subconscious will do a lot more thinking in that moment. And then look around at some people, smile at them, look out the window, say hello, get into some connection. That's your top left. Being connected to other people makes you feel safe. We are, we're programmed as hunter-gatherers. We, we don't feel safe if we don't belong to a tribe. People, people who are in unusual jobs, like us, or people who have a disability, will often not feel part of the tribe. They need to belong to a bigger, another, they need other tribes to belong to. Try, to. try to belong to your tribe. Make connections with your tribe. Arrive a few minutes early for a meeting and say hello to people and have a bit of social chit chat. So they feel that they know you and trust you. Go to your IOSH meetings, phone your friends instead of liking them on Facebook. Uh, What's in the middle? Um, cradle to grave purpose. Know what it is that you want out of life. We're gonna come on to values. But B, if you, don't, if you haven't chosen the life that you're living, then whose life are you living? What do you want out of life? How are you gonna make your mark? How are you gonna, what's, what for you is gonna be a life well lived? And then finally on the right, um, that's about awe. Um, it's good to feel awe each day. A-W-E or rather than lumps of metal. Um, it gives you the sense that there's more to life than you. It gives you some beauty. It gives you some magnificence to, to just take your mind away. And again, it, it recalibrates it. If you can get out and see some real, a bit of nature, um, look up at the sky, look at the trees, look at the clouds, feel the air on your face. At the very least, look at some nice pictures. Hear, listen to some really great music while you're doing other stuff. Uh, how do we build resilience into our life? Um, there are some one-time actions that you can take. 
buy a decent mattress, buy decent pillows, buy blackout blinds, buy an alarm clock instead of having your phone by the side of your bed. Switch off your notifications because they endlessly distract you. Um, buy smaller plates if your portions are too big. Um, uh, I had a friend whose husband started working from home. She had to fit locks on the kitchen cupboards and she only unlocked. She didn't, he wasn't given the key. Uh, her friends who can't trust themselves to go to bed on time, they've put a power plug onto the Wi-Fi so it switches off at 10 o'clock. Those are some one times. Then look at the resilience habits that you can build in. What can you do in two minutes or even one minute that will make you stronger? The, the, identify the behavior that you want, and it may only be the beginning of a ritual behavior, like, yes, I ought to go running, but you know what, at, at least I'll put my shoes on and step outside the door. What reward are you going to get out of it? Is there an intrinsic reward, or do you have to give yourself an award, a re, I beg your pardon, a reward, whether it's um, hopefully a cuddle or a uh, a bit of nice music or giving yourself a gold star something preferably not the Mars bar um, and then what's going to be the trigger for that behavior because if you've got a routine event in your day that you can attach a habit to it's going to be a lot easier than to do it than having to remember to to remember the habit so pick a trigger Things that you do all the time, brushing your teeth, putting your clothes on, switching your computer on, stepping outside the door, approaching the, uh, the office, any of those things. Build yourself a habit and start, um, start doing it. Um, and once you've built your habit and got used to it and doing it starts to feel weird, it's not doing it, I beg your pardon, feels weird, then you can tack another habit onto it. You would be astonished at how much you can do for yourself in just a few one or two minutes a day. Um, and often actually you'll get, you'll get so much more out of it. One of your habits should be, it's if I've been sat down for 25 minutes, my, my training delegates have been sat down for 20 minutes, stand up, move around, look around, move your muscles, have a think. What are values all about? We don't think about them. We think about our goals. We think about what we want to do in a few, in two years time, in one year time. We think about our organization's goals and our employer's goals. Um, but we often don't think about what we want out of our lives and what we value. Um, and yet, if your, if your life, if your day does not support your values, it will not feel like a good day. If your day, if your life conflicts with your values, it's going to constantly aggravate and disappoint and alarm you. It's going to have, it's going to have all your stress responses kicking off because this is, this is not what I want. This is not me. I do not feel fulfilled. I actually feel threatened. The, the, this butterfly diagram is part of it, it's an extract from a huge list of things that different people value. And there's a, there's a whole exercise that um, I can make available to you if you want about how you identify the things that matter to you and then condense that into your top, your top three, your top five personal values, the ones that really drive everything that you do. And once you have identified those values, you can then say, okay, does my day align with my values? And if it doesn't, what am I going to do about it? How am I going to make it align? Or how am I going to start looking for a new type of day? Okay, to-do lists. We all have to-do lists, I think. Most of us have to-do lists. Um, and some of us have very demanding and very threatening and very stressy to-do lists. Um, and some of us who strongly value organization can spend a tremendous amount of time and energy managing our to-do lists. I, I have a friend who I think is not, is not possibly quite as unusual as he ought to be, who has 200 to-do lists and can spend 
the better part of a week managing them. That's not what they're for. Um, so <laughs> uh, I hope there's nothing quite like that. But we do need to, we need to manage them, we need to make them work for us. A good to-do list is a way of getting stuff out of your worry, out of the worry section of your brain and onto a bit of paper so that you can start to manage it. You can decide what to do about it and create a plan. Your brain likes plans. We call this session, put your own mask on first after the, uh, the safety announcement on airliners. Why are those safety announcements there? Because they give you a plan. If they tell you in advance at the beginning of the flight that if we crash, you've got to make your way to the exits, which are here, here, here. You've got to undo your seatbelt, which is like so, because it's completely different to a car seat belt, which is the one you're used to, and when in a state of, uh, and which in a state of panic you will reach for, and you will be so panicked and your brain so locked out that you will never see the buckle at your belly button. You will only go to the buckle, which is not there at the side. That's what that's all about. It's a, the whole safety announcement on an aircraft is giving you a plan. Your to-do list is a way of giving you a plan. I suggest that we approach uh, to-do lists in the same way that we approach risk assessment. Let's go for five steps to controlling your to-do list and five steps to controlling the demands upon you. The first thing with your to-do list is to capture everything. All the things that you have to do, check the past, check the future, what do I have to do? Um, a lot of these will be projects rather than actual tasks. Then estimate what's involved. What are the tasks? How long are they going to take? What skills do they need? Not necessarily mine. What's the context? Why do I say context? Is this something I have to do face to face? Um, is it something I could do by Skype? Is it an email? Is it, a, is it telephone? Is it really quiet planning time? Where do I have to be to do some of this stuff? That helps you group some stuff together. Then evaluate. What do I get out of this? Who's it for? What do I get out? What's in it for me? What's the purpose? What is the opportunity and what is the cost? And at that point, there may be things you're thinking, actually, this is not worth it, or it is worth it, but I could get somebody else to do it. I'll come on to control in just a moment. The final stage, as always, is review. Review what you've been up to every week, Every day, I would say as well, little one at the end of the day, but every week, every month and every year, possibly even a quarter as well, review what, how did it go? What was my plan? What was my reality? What am I learning from this? Am I getting to where I want to go? Are we having a good life? What are these controls? How do you control your to-do list, control the tasks that are on your list? I have shoehorned these into um, D's. It's just about possible to find a D for each of them. What's the to-do list version of eliminate? You dump it. This is just never going to happen. This might be something you've been procrastinating on for ages. Sometimes you have to bite the bullet and say, it's just not happening. Dodge. Stop saying yes. Stop volunteering when people say, who could do this? Just do what everybody else does and glaze over for a moment and, and don't think before you volunteer if you're going to volunteer it has to be worth it to you or volunteer afterwards decline so, you know, I'm ever so ever so grateful for you asking me this it's lovely that you thought of me but you know what um, this is everything else that I have to do and I'm not quite sure how it fits in what else if it's to your boss what would you like what what would you like me to not do in order to take this on how do you reduce the demand on you? Delegate, delegate, delegate. What can you make other people do? What can you make managers do? If you can't delegate, then you have to get better at doing it. That's what I mean by deft. More focused, um, more determined, and having a clearer idea of what is good enough rather than brilliant. Um, if you can put it off or you can negotiate down the demand, that's a way of sort of slightly separating you from it. You're still having to do it. 
don't let anybody else let you down. If other, dog yourself um, in terms of making sure that you're on schedule for your deadlines and make sure everybody else stays on schedule too. Your final thing, if you really are going to have to do this, when? Get it in your diary. In enough time that you can still deliver to the deadline in spite of all the things that you know are going to be thrown at you in the meantime. And when you've got stuff in your diary, be very clear about what, any slots that people are actually allowed to overwrite. Can other people put notes meetings in your diary for you or do you absolutely defend your diary? And in that protect thing, I'm going to say that you need to put your own resilience actions as well. You have to prioritize yourself. You have to learn to be selfish because if you don't look after yourself, you can't look after anybody else. And if you don't look after yourself, they will master you and stress will master you. So diarize your self-defense as well. Yeah, very briefly, your new to do. That looks like a long list. This is stuff I go through in my head and sometimes on paper when I'm trying to work out how, what's involved in a project and is the whole thing worthwhile? Is it really gonna happen on time? If so, when is it going to happen? It's, uh, it's like a, it's, it's the input to a Gantt chart really. It's about project management. Um, and some of my project management looks a bit like this. And you can see very briefly, I'm looking at what do I get out of this? Sometimes I'm getting sleep. Um, sometimes I'm deciding down here at the bottom that something's probably not worth doing. Um, other times I'm thinking, no, I'm just, I'm getting cash out of this. So what does your new day look like? I, I still like working on paper. I mean, I, I keep my calendar and Outlook, on, or lots and lots of things on Outlook and Excel, but when it comes to what am I doing today, I, it works if I get a pen in my hand. I like drawing myself pictures. I recognize icons a lot faster than I recognize words, and they sort of anchor bits of my day. Um, I, do, I take the, the day from start to end in 30 minute slots because 25 minutes of sitting down, five minutes of standing. Obviously that's a bit harder when I'm driving. So the, the sitting down periods become longer, but so do the breaks. I tend to color code things again, and it helps me see the shape of my day much more clearly. And I color code outline, um, outline, outlook. Um, and I put in my immovables. Um, and I put in the sessions that can move around a little bit and then I leave enough space to map out or to record what actually happened versus the plan. That helps with your daily and weekly reviews. If you're being over ambitious, you will uh, consistently over ambitious or you're consistently ducking tasks, you'll, you'll see your evidence. Um, down here at the bottom, I've got my, how am I? How do I think I am today? Um, in the four main areas. Um, over on the right of the page, I've got a reminder about what my goals are. What's my long, what's my year goal? I haven't put down a five year goal here, but what's my longer term goal? And then scaling back to what are this week's goals? And then what do I hope to achieve? What are my big three things to focus on today? Not my 40 things off a to-do list, but what are today's big three things? Having things to focus on, knowing what your values are, knowing what your long-term goal, what your longer-term goals are, knowing what your today's focus is, it primes your brain to look for, look for help, really. You know what you want out of the day, your brain will start to see the things that will help. It will start to see the people that will help. If you just plow through with a, a huge to-do list, it will only concentrate on, oh my God, how am I, sorry, how on earth am I going to get this done? I can't do it. And if you think I can't, you'll go into the defeat response of stress, which is the most harmful response because it's when your brain dissociates, your consciousness dissociates and your body prepares to protect you from bleeding out. Um, you prime yourself to go into, if you like to get, if, if you're going to get stressed, you go into fight mode because you have a plan. The plan keeps you out of freeze mode. Um, feeling that you can do it 
puts you into fight mode rather than hide mode. You want to be, if you're going to get stressed, go into fight. Don't allow yourself to go into defeat. Don't just freeze, which is what people do on ships that are sinking and on aircraft that have crashed. Um, tend and defend, or befriend and defend is a lovely stress response, um, but it's just how you all get happy and fat while the ship sinks. So have a plan, know what you're looking for in the day and have a varied day and your brain will start finding the things that you need in order to help you have a successful day. I have a section of what have I not started because we all procrastinate. Um, sometimes we procrastinate because we can't believe that we can get everything done. Sometimes we procrastinate because we're scared of failure. Sometimes we're scared of success. And sometimes we just haven't scoped it out. We think it's going to be horrible and take forever. And actually it was quick and easy. Sometimes we think people will be horrible, but when we ask them nicely for help, they're delighted. Um, I have a section for other things that I might do and things that cropped up. And a big chunk in the middle for what am I doing to look after myself? How is it going? Um, some new habits a little bit further down. Um, go for four at one time, um, which isn't quite as mad as it sounds, but because they've all got offset start times and some of them are stacked. Um, after, after about a month, it starts to feel weird if I don't do them. Um, what, did I, what did I learn today? There's always some learning. Um, keep track of it. Add it to your CPD. Um, what were my wins? Celebrate your victories. People are very good at criticizing health and safety and people don't often say anything nice to us. So say nice things to yourself. Treat yourself like your best friend, not your worst enemy. Celebrate your wins and log them and talk to your manager about your wins. Talk to your bosses about the wins. Have really happy stories to share with them. Um, and finally, what am I grateful for? And what did I, what were my moments of insight, if there were any? That's, that's one, one way of building yourself um, a day that achieves your goals, your goals, um, delivers a sense of control, builds in actions that will make you physically and mentally healthier and allow you to do more for all the people that you're trying to help. Um, it will, if you check in on yourself, it reduces the chance that you will become ill before you realize what's happening. It reduces the chance of it being your doctor who tells you that you now need to take weeks, if not months off work and then get rehabilitated. Um, it allows you to talk to your colleagues about any pressure that you're under uh, and what they can do to help you. It allows you to get support, to look for support. Um, it allows you to feel that your day is controlled and to make your day a better one. That's the last of our slides. Um, I think what I'd urge you to do is work out your tells. How do you know when you're going under? Um, how do you make sure that you don't that you don't become another case study. Um, guard your resilience habits, develop them, get them into your calendar, make sure you do them every day and be more productive, but less busy, less anxious, less worried, less, not so much white rabbit as wise old sage. If you would like something a bit more than these slides, um, you can pop over to um, insperson.co.uk, um, pop me a message there. Uh, we can go into more detail about the um, stress self-assessment and even team assessments, um, some work, we can look at workbooks on realizing your values. 
um, a sort of, if you like, a children's selection box of resilience actions. Um, and then the whole business about uh, to do taming and uh, calendar templates. Um, and if you wish, we can offer a, a training and coaching as well. Um, I think that's time for questions and answers. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Alison. And I just want to say, um, I can see from a lot of the comments that have come through that this has been very positively and very well received so thank you okay so we're going to go through a couple of questions um alison that have come through so this is a comment as well as an experience i would say that someone's been going through at work um so i've worked for a company where i've been told to watch my back and record everything so in one organization i knew i was always potentially a scapegoat and that reality was realized when we had an increase in riddles due to better reporting my job became redundant i've also come across people who are very well supported in their role this doesn't always seem to happen what would you advise when you do enjoy the job but no key people aren't really listening and you don't have any support Okay, um, the first thing is to always, for, for various reasons, build your, build your make, strengthen your greater support network. Your, make sure you're well turned into family, local friends, and your IOSH colleagues. Because um, apart from anything else, if you, if you decide that the only way that, that to exit is your best option, then your contacts are going to be your best way of moving on. Um, in fact, I'd say in, it, in almost any job, I, um, keep an eye on where you want to go next. You should always be thinking about where am I going? Um, what's, what do I want to do next? And what you want to do next may well be in a different organization. So there's nothing, nothing wrong with having your exit in mind. Um, how do you get support from key people. I think, first of all, I, 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 it's not clear from here whether RIDOR are your, whether accidents are your major performance indicator, but getting them through a session where they have to, re where they're confronted with the irrefutable fact that positive, the proactive performance indicators are much more useful than negative performance indicators. Taking them through a session where they consider how you can massage the accident statistics. I mean, you could even say, would you like me to massage these? Because it's not that difficult to do. What you're seeing that, that and that they should be, pre and um, if you have to present accident stats that are rising, uh, you've got rising riddles. So is that candor or is that things getting worse? Be clear about why they're going up. Um, and if it is candor, say, actually what we're now facing is reality and we've got an opportunity to do something about it. Uh, yes, you're saying it, you said it was better reporting. You should be able to show better reporting across the board and probably maybe a change in your accident pyramid as well. So that people applaud increased reporting so long as the nasty stuff is, is better under control, but get them to focus on, on proactive performance indicators, risk assessments, training, attendance at meetings, leadership uh, presence. What do, um, when do the people on the shop floor see the directors getting interested in safety, that kind of thing. Brilliant, thank you, Alison. Okay, so is there a tool available to know or measure work-related school stress? A stress in schools, you mean? Mm. Um, I stress, stress affects absolutely every every organisation, every person. So there are there are all sorts of stress tools you can you can use. You can just go around asking people. There are surveys where you just ask people how stressed are you. Um, what you might be more interested in is what is causing your stress. Um, so there you would you'd expect there to be a stress risk assessment um, what are how what are the how is the what is for this organization what are the specific stress or significant stressors within each of the six stressor categories um, 
and I, again, there's some the teachers face some of the same issues that health and safety advisors do that your mission um, is constantly met with disappointment and um, the irritation of bureaucracy we spend I, I've been in jobs where I have spent most of my time writing reports um, and teachers spend a lot of their time reporting on their children rather than getting on with the wonderful business of changing lives and opening minds so it's it's the stress competency tools it's the um hse stress or tools um it's stress assessments i think but mess do message me if you if you want to go into it you want to discuss it more hey, thank you <clears throat> okay we've, someone's actually shared an absolutely lovely comment um i'm currently in the middle of a stress issue and this webinar has just shone a light on this for me I didn't realise it was stress. I haven't slept well for six weeks. That is my sign and I didn't realise. So a big thank you to you, Alison. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I think people, yeah, first of all, we're all designed, we, hardly anybody sleeps all the way through the night. We all wake up and go to sleep and wake up. It's a hunter-gatherer thing. Um, but not being able to get to sleep or not being able to go back to sleep when you wake up, waking up at three o'clock in the morning with your heart pounding because that's your dead of night panic period waking up very early in the morning and not being able to back to go back to sleep because your brain won't go quiet those those are signs that your alarm system is is switched on mm. okay and try some slow breathing first of all slow breathing and um some relaxation exercises how about reading a book in bed before you try and go to sleep um i think reading a book can be a nice part of your bedtime ritual um, personally, I find it a bit safer to do that out of bed, partly because my posture in bed is so awful. Um, so I'll, I'll read um, a bit of something nonsensical like Terry, Terry Pratchett and then go to bed. I do think if, if you can keep it just for the two things, then that's better. Okay. Um, so going back to resilience, how effective can stand-up desks be? Um, I think I, I'm a great fan of, of movement. Um, the, if, you if you keep one posture for, for too long, it's, it's, it's going to be bad for you, even if it's a good standing up posture. So standing up, again, still be moving around after 25 minutes. Go for a walk, go for a stroll, because you're, actually your legs and back might be a bit tight by then. I think it's a lot better than, than sitting down. Um, uh, you're much, I think you're more alert. Um, it's definitely so much better for your neck and back, much healthier for your discs. Um, don't stand stock still. Um, keep moving around from foot to foot and go off and have a wander around every 25 minutes. Okay, thank you. Oh, so, sorry, I should say, I actually sit down at a desk a lot of the time, but I sit on a space hopper because they force you into neutral and they keep you moving all the time. Great for your muscles, great for your discs, and you can bob and have a bit of fun. What's that? Did you say you sit on a space hopper? Space hopper, yeah. It's more comfortable than an exercise ball, and you can, the, uh, the, the ears uh, reduce the manual <laughs> handling difficulties. And you're working your core at the same time, yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, so someone else has commented saying this is really good advice. Uh, stress is often or usually a combination of work stress and home family issues how do you tackle or just survive both of these are they as a competing stresses in life okay um first thing is i i don't separate out to-do lists i chuck everything into a pot i might have pro you know, projects will be separate so i have work projects and home projects each of those is a different project all my to-dos in one place and all my diary um when i'm looking at my day is in one place so i i can see conflicts um decide what you're prioritizing and and defend your priorities um be think about how much review your capability if you've got a lot going on at home where do you need to cut yourself some slack or is there a way of making the home stuff less difficult or how can you cut yourself some slack if you have have routine conversations with the people that you work with about how you are. Um, I was with a firm that did a lovely thing of making every one-to-one -one a four-parter, and one-to-ones were done every week. 
a quarter of the one-to-one -one was how are you as a person the next 15 minutes how is the team the next 15 minutes what's your strategic stuff and only the last 15 minutes was about tell me about the day-to-day -day tactical nitty-gritty everybody thought it would fail that because the, the to-do list wasn't being dealt with actually it was brilliant they got a lot more out of it um, and it allows people to say today's not such a good day because I have been up uh, since four o'clock um, with a screaming toddler or a sick uh, you know, sick mother that kind of thing um, and it allows other people to talk about the, the awful things that they're going through uh, you could try to do the soldier thing of putting a different head on so I'm I've walked out the you know there's horrible stuff happening at home but I'm closing the door behind me now I'm breathing in fresh air I'm setting off to work I can put this I can park some of these issues for the next so many hours if you do need to worry about it during the day give yourself a worry slot and say okay I will worry about this at 1 15 mm -hmm. um, and I will worry about it for 15 minutes um, and don't forget to be grateful for some of the stuff you still have again happy to carry on a discussion by email okay thank you um, a lot of people have asked about the values and the values exercise that you mentioned earlier and how to align your day um, so people are asking about a where they can find this exercise um, email me um, there are various exercises that are around buried in different books um, I'll I'm about to put something together so you could get um, email me on um, and we'll um, see what we can do okay and make it nice and pointed and also a template for the diary that yeah. you say same, same answer basically same <laughs> okay fantastic okay thank you right um, let's have a look at what else we've got we've got quite a few um, what is the role of the subconscious in making me stressed big question <laughs> <laughs> um, your well your subconscious that it's essentially if you're thinking about your non-conscious brain it's it's your non-conscious brain that does the the threat detection in the first place it's primed with a bunch of stuff that it recognizes straight away as threats um things that drop things dropping on your head are always a threat um and things flying into your face um snakes stuff like that the stuff that we're programmed to recognize as a threat being isolated from your tribe is something we are programmed to recognize as a, as a very significant threat um, so it's always working people who were very badly stressed as children have threat detection systems that are super 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 efficient and will well actually not super sensitive more than super efficient and they get stressed by things that the rest of us would think are, are not a trivial it's because the the system has been so extremely used when they were children we learned to develop to, to recognize other things as stressors during our days and years as well um, uh, again if you've anyone who's anyone who's been in the air force recognizes the nato alarm uh, and will be bolted awake by it um, i had a friend who ran around his neighborhood stark naked um, oh my uh, because he's woken up by an earthquake um, <laughs> which you don't expect in Oxfordshire. Um, but to him, it was because they were being shelled. Um, that's what it kicked off. Um, so it's always there. It's always working. It's a question of, first, of undoing some of its programming, of going, actually, no, that's not a threat. It's fine. Um, and it's a question of putting it back in its box when it does not need to be doing that job. The other thing is to when you've got a very busy, very packed life is to give your subconscious a bit of air time as well. That's, that's some of the getting up every 25 minutes and wandering around because when you wander around like that, when you break focus and wander around, your subconscious can then go, ha ha ha, I can see how all of this links together and here's a brilliant, clever idea. Um, it lets you do that. Um, give, it, give it some time slots during the day to talk to you because as I said if you don't let it talk to you during the day it will start talking to you when you're trying to get to sleep. Mm. Okay thank you. Um, 
let's have a look at what else we have we've got a lot of people commenting on how useful this has been which is lovely to see managing people is challenging what is the best strategy for broaching the subject of stress when you see someone else that is clearly suffering um, do you have any practical steps or advice that you can offer um some of it might be the same as some procrastination advice just do something uh just start if you i say if you're managing a team then i, I refer back to the four part one-to-one -one. um if you start that practice then it gives you an immediate in to asking how somebody is um they like say oh everything's absolutely great and you're saying well you don't look quite so great to me you look a bit you look a, a bit tired Tired is one way in because stress makes us tired. Um, so why, you know, what's making you tired? Um, if you don't want to wait to for a one-to-one, -one, a just a gentle you know, touch to the arm, and you don't seem your usual self. How are you? Or you don't seem your usual self. How are you feeling today? Um, you, you know, you, you look like. Have you, did the kids wake you up? Or the things, you know, the things that you want to discuss. Is there something that is there anything that we can do? But just start with how are you today? How are you today gets people from is slightly different from how are you? Because how are you? We have a habit of responding. I'm fine. Even if you have even if you just amputated your feet, you'd say, Oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Um I guess it's about being human about it, isn't it? Yeah. Not forgetting that there is a human aspect when when you're in a work environment around the people that you're working with. Yeah, we're all, we're very we're social creatures. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't be afraid to say, you, know, you don't look, you don't look great. You know, I'm here, you know, I'll just say, you know, I'm here. And I've even had people, you know, sort of message somebody across the office saying, don't look so good. Do you want a chat? Do you want a coffee? Take the, you can take somebody out of the building so they feel they've escaped and they're in a safer place. Mm. Mm. Okay. We've still got quite a few questions coming in. Um, what we'll do, we'll probably take another, as this session is being recorded, if we take another five minutes or so with uh, the questions. Um, so if anyone does have to leave, you're welcome to do so, and then you can come back to the, the questions part um, when you're sent the link um, for, the, for YouTube. Um, so we'll, we'll do another one. So. I've been asked to act as a safety advisor for the company that I work for. I might add that I live outside the UK. So based on my training and previous work experience, I started to put things in place relating to health and safety. I was then called into a meeting and was told that I was not paying attention to my main job and paying too much attention to health and safety, which was not true as I brought into, as I was brought in to show that I was keeping on top of my main job okay that's unfortunate um so there you, you from from the way the question's written it sounds as though you suspect that they they would like a little bit less health and safety from you um they if you've got information to demonstrate that you are on top of your main job then obviously the, the first thing obviously as you point out there is to challenge the idea that that you're letting your main job drop um, if you they might be wondering how you've managed to do this extra stuff on top of a job that was already full um, you <laughs> you show them how how you have achieved that um, might worth digging into is there anything that's upsetting them about the progress you're making in health and safety is everybody happy about it or is somebody feeling ruffled feathers? Um, happy to go on, happy to discuss that by email. That uh, sounds like it needs, it sounds like something that needs maybe a bit more digging into. Hmm. Um, the same person has also said that how do you deal with the stress of introducing change to an organization that just treats health and safety as lip service? Oh. Um, I think we've all been there. Um, there okay sometimes it's can you get a powerful ally can you get can you convince somebody that some of this stuff is worth doing also think think about the style of health and safety that you're trying to sell to them 
because if we if we get too preoccupied with carpets and stairs when actually their big issues are stress and violence then we're um, missing the point so make sure that we're banging the right drum um, and have have a candid discussion with them about their appetite for health and safety all organizations have different appetites for different sorts of risk genuinely what is their risk appetite on the other and if they're prepared to tolerate an enormous amount a very high level of accident and injury why would they want to why would they want to tolerate high levels of stress which would mean that a lot of their staff is sitting at work being um, stupid, and self, stupid and selfish and accident prone. Um, so again, you, happy to happy to discuss by message how you can um, uh, paint a picture of better value from health and safety. Mm. Okay, I think we're going to do one more question. Um, stress assessments. What is your advice for a line manager carrying out a stress assessment? and the member of staff has personal stress issues that are affecting their work. Righty-ho. Um, as a manager at work, you can't be responsible for somebody's home stress, but you have to accept that it is making, it's reducing your capability because you've got somebody who's probably underperforming. They're, they're not so much, they're not here as much as not mentally here as much as the rest of the team. And they may well be creating pressure for the rest of the team. If that individual is a manager, they're probably creating problems for the people managing them. So you need to manage the stress, you, you need to manage that stressed person as a stress or for the rest of the team. Um, and I think that allows you to put some effort into managing their stressed um, behavior. Um, so I could recommend, first of all, putting them, taking them through some of the stress first aid techniques to get them into a different place when they are in work to, and to allow, get them to create some boundaries between work stress and home stress. The, that, that's a part of what my to-do list is about is creating boundaries around stuff. And part of the, um, controlling demands upon you is creating boundaries. Um, so it, yeah, a stressed individual doesn't come up as one of the great organizational stressors, but it's draining your resources and it's uh, increasing the emotional, to, emotional and work demands on other people. Okay. All right, I think we'll finish off with a comment uh, where someone's actually said that the company said it was going to conduct stress awareness courses and has now put the plug on this and with no reason why. And they do acknowledge that stress and mental awareness has to be one of the most important subjects which can and does affect all of us. And I guess there is no way of getting away from stress. It's understanding how to deal with the stress, is what, which is what we're seeing that people are very much valuing um, in today's webinar. So thank you very much, Alison. Um, it's been very insightful. Um, so yeah, we will end the Q&A there. Um, if and you are welcome to actually contact Alison directly. So on the email that you can see there. Um, and also, you are also welcome to contact me as well if you've got any questions that we can actually forward on to Alison as well. There are some questions that we've not answered, but they will be sent on directly to Alison to answer and we will send her answers back to you. So I'd like to end the session by thanking Alison and all of you that have joined us today for this webinar. Thank you very much for your input, your questions and your comments. For reflection on your CPD, please take some points into account which you might find helpful. So what did you learn today and what was new and what will you be doing with the knowledge that you have gained from this webinar? How will the skills you have learned be applied to the way that you work? Um, like mentioned earlier, we will be sending out the link to the presentation recording to the email address that you have registered with. So please do look out for this email. Um, this, hopefully this will be up on YouTube um, by the end of next week. So I'd like to thank you all again very much and we shall end the webinar here. Thank you very much, Alison. And thank you all. Um, and have a the rest of your day is great. And so the final thing, yeah, 
very happy to take more questions by email. Okay, wonderful. Thank you all.